So welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome Nick Petrovic here, um, who is visiting us here as a Finno visiting professor and spent some time in the lab. It's my great pleasure to have him here. He is doing things that are not directly related to the activities we are doing here in the lab, but nevertheless, his thing is fun to show. Um, and probably you may also get some insights because there are still some connections between the things that we are doing in the lab and what Nick's research is about. Um, so Nick studied civil engineering in Zagreb quite a while back and after his PhD moved to the UK where he spent some time as a postdoc and then got appointed as um, a lecturer in Oxford University and then is in Oxford since quite a while and stepped up, became a professor a couple of years ago and is now a member of the Royal Academy of Science and has a chair of the Royal Academy of Science for Impact Engineering. It's my great pleasure to have him here and Nick, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Stachnitz. Um, it's been a real pleasure to get here and, um, and of course uh, if we rehearse this uh, a great deal more we'll be a lot more precise about some of these dates and so on but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that um, we're all here and that we can perhaps um, talk about things that um, would perhaps motivate you in uh, in different directions after uh, you have completed your research in the area that is um, that you're researching here. So um, in Oxford uh, we have had a research in impact engineering for many years uh, and I'm um, becoming senior myself now to have continued that long um, tradition of research in, in dynamics in the first place and then um, impact as a, as, a, as a consequence of explosions and collisions. And, um, and we have had the exposure to the high performance uh, engineering and industry that has uh, enabled us to do interesting things. And uh, normally I would put on the slide here many other names other than just mine, uh, because it's never, as you know, it's never the work of just the professor. It's always the work of everybody else. Uh, and, uh, and my job is to make sure that it's all done in a coordinated manner and that we all know what we're doing and why we're doing it. So here, uh, very briefly, just to um, cover where that setting is, uh, university, uh, as I um, took some of pictures uh, many time, many years ago, uh, is comprised of four uh, key units uh, that are divisions in humanities that would uh, populate the British Parliament. Most of the people who studied there would go and work as members of Parliament. <laughs> And, um, and I work in what is known as the Mathematical, Physics, uh, Physical and Life Sciences Division uh, within which uh, falls uh, the Department for Engineering Science. And it's been, uh, we've been lucky to, uh, here is really an old slide, we have been now sitting on whatever ranking as number one even above Caltech and Stanford for a few years back. And so I'm sorry for not having actually the most up-to-date slide here. Uh, probably my, some of my colleagues will take it against me if this goes public. But um, <laughs> um, it's, it's important to say that we are relatively young, you know, just 100 years or so of uh, history compared to some old um, uh, universities around the world. But this is Faculty of Engineering. Engineering isn't uh, a very new science. I, I went back to Zagreb uh, last November, a year ago, to celebrate a centenary. So this is still an older engineering subject as, as such uh, than the one I, I originally studied in that would have had a longer tradition in some of the other, in other subjects. And so um, within that uh, department of engineering there is at the moment more than 100 um, what we now call associate professors and professors. The terminology has changed a little bit in the recent years. And there is a, a really a large number of research fellows and postdoctoral researchers, uh, lots of support staff, because there is a, a reasonably large turnaround of uh, you know, funding that uh, supports various activities. And, and the main um, key research activities are in, in the principal engineering subjects, such as civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. But there is also a very strong, as you probably know, and some of you uh, have collaborated with, research in robotics, research in biomedical as the kind of new branches that emerge and, and bring people together. And um, more closely to where, again, uh, I work in solid mechanics and materials engineering, you've got a group of about 50 plus people who are there uh, divided into you know, these categories of there are 13 of us who call ourselves professors. 
We've got some visiting academics at all times, trying to, to uh, establish and, and maintain con uh, communications with other people. We have got about 40 postdocs at the moment. Uh, the number always changes. I never have this right. And about 25 postgraduate students, or mainly PhD students, um, very re relatively few master students or master of science students. But we also have got a good team of support staff, technicians, IT, and admin, uh, that these days is essential this to, this to, to operate. Again, narrower down in the impact engineering team. There are four academics now uh, that uh, after 20 years at Oxford, I have managed to uh, persuade the university that one person cannot anymore handle what uh, has grown over the years. And, and this, uh, there are four of us now working in the field and we've got three visiting academics. And you can see if you compare the numbers of this and, uh, and above nesting unit is we about half, if not more than a half of that whole uh, solid mechanics group. And, um, and what we do is very much motivated by the understanding of what materials do. And you will agree that at the answers of everything, if you want to build a robot, if you want to build a, uh, any system these days, you have to start from how do I, what do I choose? Do I choose a piece of metal? Do I choose a piece of plastic or a composite of something more sophisticated? And very soon you find out that it, 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 the choice is, is not accidental. You have to really go back and make a really informed decision. Why do you choose this piece of material for this particular function? And this is what we try to do when the narrower application of those materials is when they, when they get exposed to what I say here, very demanding, if not extreme conditions. And those are normally described as these charts here present as the sort of things that you get at the ultimately kind of large scale of interplanetary impacts and down to the very small scales when we do something in our laboratory where we throw a particle the size of a micron, uh, perhaps propelled by laser uh, spallation onto another target that you really need some really fancy equipment to actually even capture that, let alone diagnose that experiment. So in that kind of context, going from uh, really small to rather large, again, just a few pictures to illustrate that these situations are really relevant to us, both from the point of view of knowing that there are bits flying around space that may hit us, even to this sort of scale, that we have got equipment in space that we want to protect from uh, those events that may put uh, some really extreme either mechanical or thermal load upon those uh, pieces of equipment. And then again, more closely to home, you know, we need things that transport us on a daily basis, whether that's a, a bicycle, a car, or aircraft, they need to be again designed in a way that relies on the best possible materials you can choose or engineer, as we try to say in our research, and then uh, make it fit for purpose. And when we take, for example, this, and I'm going to be talking about uh, a typical gas turbine aircraft engine here as a good example of how we applied our research, then um, you have got lots of reasons why you have to worry whether some impact load happens, because these engines operate at such uh, regimes that they, uh, they are really a big vacuum sweepers going first down and up, up and down the runways, and even when they are in the air, they suck in things at speed that is uh, phenomenal. Also, there are lots of rotating parts that can break for whatever reason, and you can't allow those breaking parts to bring down the whole aircraft because that would, of course, be a pretty bad thing to have. And these are the bits, again, that um, are bits of motivation, if you wish, that drive what we do. If you try to then put that onto a little bit more safety basis, then you realize that uh, those things are common to transportation. Of course, lots of defense uh, issues come up. Medical, uh, that, come hap that happen a lot, especially in sport that we know, also in transportation, that are medically, medically related consequences of accidents or, or, or uh, traffic accidents or something of that kind. And then, of course, in consumer products. Uh, you know, I dare say that you know, a few years back when Apple approached us whether we should help them design the next iPhone that it doesn't break to, when it falls on the floor, we just didn't have time for that. And, and that sounds like uh, really arrogant, doesn't it? But uh, we don't. We don't. <laughs> and, um, and, and how then we go about with all that knowledge we need to 
um, uh, engage to uh, design these uh, the widgets is that we really, again analyze it, break it down to even more important elements of the knowledge we, we collect. And this is going back in, in terms of, at least in terms of mathematics and mechanics, it goes into understanding the kinematics of motion that gets you to the point where the materials under consideration move and deform in the process. And then when they deform under really extreme conditions such that they have to break, and they do break, then and you know that they will break, then you have to manage that process of uh, fracture and, uh, and the consequential motion of more particles to understand why that happens, how you can use that to dissipate even more kinetic energy. So that's another slide here that shows an example of a design process of the aircraft engine. In the process of designing, one experiment will explode a bit of explosive DNA root of a blade that will take it out. Here in this case it shows that it can be so bad that it takes another blade out. And then of course what, ca what happens here, that the eccentricity of the whole engine is such that the whole shaft breaks up. And you could see that what was here, uh, the center of this engine rotating here, it moved up because the whole thing lost its uh, integrity and, and basically uh, would have taken the whole engine off the wing. And if the whole engine come off the wing, of, comes off the wing during the flight, I, I bet you what you like, it would spill your gin, gin and tonic in the process. And uh, it wouldn't be a comfortable uh, ride until you land. And, so, and, and this, is, this is where really it all comes together. Understanding that things like collisions and explosions uh, lead to generation of some unanticipated or undesirable kinetic energies that you have to then in some way dissipate and how you do that most of the time is through inelastic deformation of materials and then later on sliding of particles or fragments that you can dissipate as much energy as you have got in the system that you need to handle. So our research has got simple mission. is to be able to simulate all those in-service conditions, whatever they are. You're putting an autonomous robot on Mars to do a project for you. It has to be designed in such a way that you can predict. And how you do predict, you first collect the data as much as you can, put it that in the laboratory, subject those materials to those um, conditions, and then quantify. That means really get <coughs> uh, all the diagnostics tools you can possibly get to get to understand what's happening, and then try to understand based on that observed and quantified phenomena, and then simulate it. Most of our time eventually goes into building software that simulates those uh, experiments. And experiments then get extrapolated to simulate in-service conditions. And so I'm just going to illustrate that, first of all, in a, in a flow chart. So if anybody gives you uh, a piece of material that they may think it's qualifying for a service, jo job in service, they will subject it to experiments, do some thinking about it, do some programming, get some data that uh, you need to run simulations, see whether the results uh, comparable to the experimental observations, and then you do some either inverse modeling and some machine learning based learning, or you have to improve something in your algorithms, theory, or experiments in order to perform this actively, correctly, accurately. The outcomes are pretty much always in our research the predictive modeling capability that we then deliver to industry who needs to build the widgets. And the other thing is that we sometimes go back to the people who make materials, it's more than sometimes I take, to help them modify those material systems. And more and more what's happening is why the title of the wider research groups that I work in has gone from solid mechanics into solid mechanics and materials engineering. More and more these people ask us, could you help us with these simulations and your previous knowledge to engineer new materials? And that's becoming really important. So in that context, we have accumulated the experimental sense, lots of equipment. This is an illustration, a combination of a CAD drawing of a gas gun where you propel things under, under pressure. There's a projectile coming through. And then we combined it with an experimental uh, data, uh, camera footage of something that comes through, hits a target. And this is a bit old, and you will forgive me for having chosen a little bit of older images because of uh, various reasons here, or, uh, reasons of uh, intellectual property and, um, and, and having to uh, be careful about what I can talk and cannot talk about. 
And you can see here that the diagnostics here would have been that on the back of this composite material panel, there will be some strain gauges with some wires. The dots were here somewhat randomly positioned for something called digital image correlation that I'm sure you have done in different, for different purposes. And then, of course, we would have done that in some more detail. You can see some of these dots having traces of how they move under impactor. And then, of course, here in a, in a proper uh, strain analysis, you would see how a piece of material here loaded in a particular way develops a fracture and breaks. So all of that can be done in our laboratory where you move things at speeds of up to a kilometer a second on one set of equipment and up to uh, the latest gun we got about two kilometers a second that can push one side of the material to the boundary condition and make it do something that is important for us to investigate. And, uh, and some, some other illustrations of that, of course, why, again, that is relevant to those products that I uh, mentioned earlier, is that if you went then to look at what would happen to a particular component, this is one of the older experiments that were performed uh, some time ago by the industry that looks into uh, the resistance of a fan blade of the engine to bird strike. There was a bag of gelatin here, this is similar to this one here, that hit the blade, and you can see the blade, part of the blade got torn because that initial cycle of the design process did not predict things correctly, and as a result of that you had, um, uh, it, had a, it had obviously a, a next cycle in the design. This is a view um, of a slightly different blade in a different uh, engine that um, would have done exactly the same, uh, and and then, of course, uh, historically, this came to us uh, as a desire to quantify this behavior better. And the early work, as I go, goes back a few years, would have then resulted in putting some marking on the blades uh, using, obviously, multiple cameras, as you can see here, as well been used. And this marking would have resulted in tracing three-dimensional motion of the blade itself. And of course here, this um, particular video is limited just to illustrate that yes, we, did, we could do this, but uh, going beyond the impact point with this particular bag of gelatin that simulated the, the bird on impact uh, would have um, you know, been a, a big mess happening and you try to then uh, work out uh, things from it. And the reason why I'm kind of putting that out is because these particular images on this slide would have been a motivated uh, uh, research for one of my students who, and this is something you may find relevant to you, is the one who did all the image processing for these kind of footages and ended up uh, generating some really relevant data sets to the industry to the point where uh, you know, that took him, uh, after he completed his PhD, to work on something seemingly completely unrelated but with the same tools that he needed, the same sort of uh, software development and data processing that he needed to engage. He now works for planet.com down in San Francisco. He is taking images from the constellation of satellites that are you know, floating around the planet, and they are analyzing those images with a very much the same technology he needed to employ here, because the motion blur in front of high-speed cameras is equivalent to the motion blur that he gets from a satellite image that is a result of a tiny little motion of the camera in space or whatever it is that causes that um, equivalent, uh, let's say, bad image um, uh, being taken as a result. And so, um, um, just going through this slide. And again, if you think that birds don't hit the aircraft often, just get an image of typical things that happen at the airports. This is the one that I may hope will play. Don't blink now, the bird's coming. There you are. And we have to land, obviously, it's been bad.
Well, that was a bird strike on a, on a military aircraft. You heard it eject, eject, eject at the end, and the aircraft clearly crashed to the land. And um, uh, luckily, they have been able to eject. And, uh, and, it's been, and this is quite common. Just one engine manufacturer in the world would report every year about 3,500 to 4,000 bird strikes. Some of it are small birds, doesn't, don't matter, but some of, it, some of it are quite big ones. And the, you know, if, if this can happen, then of course... <laughs> so clearly, clearly the, clearly the chance of a bird strike is, is bigger than we would have probably thought. And, um, uh, <laughs> And, and, and I, can, I can tell you that it, it, part, of, um, part of what we have done historically about it is that um, we have looked at, together with industry, in, in standardizing the issue of the bird strike. Uh, there are so many different birds and so many different occasions where this can happen. And what we have done uh, a lot uh, about is to look at standardizing an artificial bird material that would simulate the actual impact so that it's very realistic. And that he ended up with doing something uh, uh, very, very, um, uh, <laughs> very funny at the end of the day, buying some sponges at the petrol station, the cellular sponges, impregnating them with uh, uh, raspberry gelatin that you put uh, on, on, a, on a cake when you make it at home and making that in a particular ratio that gave us the best results of anything else we tried from rubbers to, I don't know, whatever polymers. And, uh, and that, that, was, uh, that was quite... Quite, um, quite funny outcome. But you know, that should convince you that this is not just sort of experimental trial and error. Uh, behind all of that, there is uh, lots of what uh, really falls under continuum mechanics. And uh, mathematics of that has been well known for uh, a couple of hundred years. But it's, even if it's been known for a couple of hundred years as a, as a part of the variational calculus, it has grown in the last few decades into something that then relies on some really high performance computing and uh, uh, lots of computing science that, that merges into, into what uh, we have known as, again, mathematics and, and continuum mechanics. These days, when we talk about these, these topics, it's a lot about, again, vectorization, parallelization. I just wanted to kind of, uh, okay, skip this, uh, um, this the sort of things that, um, come on the sort of things that you would need to operate these days in a vectorized, parallelized, with an open source community, because there's no way in a small team you can develop everything. All, of course, wrapped into one or more uh, uh, intuitive user interfaces that bring people together rather than make it all difficult for everybody. But at the end of the day, all our computational capabilities about finding that equilibrium of a solid body as it moves through space and, and, and deforms as a result of relative motions of the points on the same body, which cause strain, stress, fracture, and that's all not good for uh, the materials that we want to uh, use in our applications. And this is just a few illustrations. Like if you, if you take an illustration of a bird strike impact on a blade, you can see these count, cont contour plots of uh, stresses that develop under impact, and then um, and then these are the illustrations of various methods that we have used to simulate these, these kind of uh, phenomena. And, uh, and as, I, as I move the slide, because that, of course, is the, the difficult one, all of that, oh dear, that's the, that's the slide that always uh, causes trouble. And I maybe need to start it from scratch. So at the end of the day, that experimentation and numerical simulations have to work hand in hand. And if you are in the community that I normally operate in, everybody would agree very much so that when it comes to experiments, it's easy and relatively inexpensive to perform a large number of small scale experiments, learn as much as you can about your material at that scale, and then as you go up towards the design of the component of something, you reduce that number of experiments to an absolute minimum because at the end of the day, each of those experiments will be dramatically more expensive than the one at a smaller length scale. And for example, if you, and the aviation authorities require anything that flies from engines to aircraft to be tested in real size, an experiment of, I don't know, crashing an aircraft of the new Airbus design or a 
new engine of whomever is, is producing it would be in the order of 20 to 30 million euros. You don't want to do that experiment more than once, just to prove that it's worthy of flying. And that's what's why, why it's so much uh, complemented by modeling, where you need to just do maybe one or two models to show that this is corresponding to number of experiments here. And then as, it, as you go up in the design, the number of simulations grows because you want to explore all sorts of variations or variants of that design that enables you to come up with a good product. And for us in the research team, <coughs> we then respond to those demands. And I'll just have a few slides now to show <coughs> how for each of the typical material systems that get built into uh, these kind of products of require high performance, we operate normally at these three typical length scales, what we call micro, meso, and macro. And that is what um, has been uh, the case now for solid 10 years that I have held a, a senior professorship position uh, successful to the point that we have created not just a number of publications, obviously, that are illustrated here, but also attracted a number of people. So here it suggests that based for these metals and polycrystalline uh, met the materials in general, uh, you know, you could go and expand this slide into a number of other slides that can go in details. And then composite material is very popular these days for various reasons with uh, long fibers and poly polymeric matrices. And again, same three length scales that are relatively easy to uh, diagnose in the laboratory. And then even more people get attracted to that. The interesting thing to point here, for example, is that we have had a very long-term relationship with the Technical University of Dresden. So, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five people who are um, members of my, or have been members of my team, who came from uh, that university just on this particular topic. And, um, and again, uh, more materials. This is something that's normally used in protection. And it's, uh, again, something that we looked at at three different length scales. I'm here a little bit more focused on simulations than on experimentation, again, just for illustration. And it's all really multi-scale. And that's where um, there is an opportunity for people to uh, look at what are the other reasons uh, that we are here together today. And there are so many, um, so many, uh, opportunities for automation of the work that we have done practically manually all in the laboratory where uh, the knowledge, skills and tools of the trade that come from robotics community are also now very much uh, welcome to join that because what we want to do is we want to make sure that we take a human error element from what we do in our experiments and we think that we can give robots that rep those repetitive tasks that need to be really precise, but we don't really want to do any more by hand. And at the same time, what we want to do is to engage machine learning and artificial intelligence to think complementary with us to find out whether maybe we miss something. We should provide those, uh, those pieces of software with various inputs and outputs that we have generated over the years well, maybe they will come up with a suggestion, why don't you do this as well, which we haven't thought about before. And, and just to give you an idea that, you know, we have had uh, interaction with all these people over the years uh, just for what we have been doing. And I believe that uh, as we are now uh, trying to open a collaboration between these fields, that the working and somewhere on the border between fields will, will generate more of such, um, of such collaborations and such good, good results. And just for illustration, uh, one such character who uh, three years ago um, worked on a really f fundamental little piece of algorithm for distance searching uh, ended up as um, you know, one of those who were one of the three papers referred to this particular conference. And uh, he was completely you know, chuffed to appear there on the stage and, uh, and say, um, um, you know, what he did on, uh, on this particular <coughs> GJK <coughs> um, distance search algorithm, which was um, quite interesting because it's something that normally people do in um, computer graphics more than the, the we do in, in impact engineering. But at the end of the day, when you think about it, in computer graphics, 
the distance search is just as important as it is for us when we look at, when we look at computing collisions with really large number of uh, computational entities. And, uh, and another character uh, that has won, again, I'm really talking about something which is about two or three years old, who won himself a t-shirt, as we say, been there, got a t-shirt uh, for the best paper on a particular uh, aspect of uh, composite materials development, uh, again, and simulations that is just another one of those little proofs that when you have worked in a field for a while, that you start generate the results that are globally relevant and recognized. And that's, uh, I think, what, uh, this is a this piece of work that uh, illustrates that what he has done there, uh, and, the based on, and based on that, again, to drive into these simulations. I just wanted to then uh, close with something that I thought might be a, a fun bit at the end, just to show you how we don't, we don't just do hard, hard work, as I'm sure you also try to find some fun uh, in what you do. So one of my postdocs put a little summary of uh, an experimental project that he did to investigate the ballistic limits at really high temperatures of some material that is used in, um, in a part of um, a system where that resistance to, low, uh, to impact at high temperature uh, was uh, very important. And so let's uh, just see how he has combined that uh, set of results with a little bit of fun. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick. Thank Time you. Questions. So one of the questions that I do have is, um, you're investing quite some computational resources into your simulations. So what role do so-called so surrogate models play where you basically use your simulation system to 
generate input output training data and then use machine learning algorithms to basically shortcut your super expensive model computations just by because you're able to generate training data automatically through the simulation system itself? The answer is not yet, yeah. uh, uh, but that's the, that's the plan. And so uh, we do have an, uh, the results of many simulations and obviously the results of many experimentations that uh, create those uh, data sets, inputs and outputs. What we haven't done at all to engage machine learning yet is exactly that bit in the middle. And, uh, and that's where um, our current uh, thinking is uh, to exploit that as much as we can. Uh, we're clearly aware of the fact that uh, some of our customers, and including ourselves, uh, are suspicious about you know, what would some sort of machine learning algorithm fit some polynomials in something in between input and output. But at the end of the day, as you say, um, all of that at the end of the day are some mathematical constructs that give you a good result. And if the result is good and it's, it is possible to extrapolate in a way that is possible to demonstrably validate with some other experiments, well, it becomes a valid tool. And so that's an opportunity for us to explore the field further. And it's currently part of our um, current research uh, and uh, current proposals to include that more into our work. Yeah, thanks. Questions? Yeah, come on. Uh, to be absolutely blatantly honest, again, uh, uh, all of that and none of that. Uh, so we are at the moment working on a project that is trying to get our software onto those platforms. Uh, one particular uh, quite large project we are engaged in uh, in the UK um, does have all those um, platforms on offer. And we are working now on the so-called mini apps uh, to try how our software performs on those platforms in order to find out which one is the best for the type of software we are running. There is a combination of things where we have got computational units that are part of the discretization of the domains where you could put them on the GPUs because they're doing lots of repetitive stuff that is really, um, you know, really perfectly suited for GPUs. But there is also, uh, there are lots of if statements here and there that make it difficult to just place it on the GPU. So there is, uh, there, is that, uh, there is that thing in, 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 in at the moment involved. Otherwise, uh, these uh, clusters that we work on, uh, we've got some small clusters in-house, and, and there are national uh, facilities that are uh, on two or three locations in the country that we have now got access to through this project. Both. Um, uh, High-speed cameras have been traditionally used to um, record as much as possible of the optical, obviously, um, uh, what optically you can record, and, do, and used for digital image correlation to, to measure relative motion of points on the, on the surfaces to measure strains and therefore uh, related deformation. But um, uh, the loading is applied by either projectiles or instrumented, again, uh, devices that have got other ways of measuring and then triggering the whole recording and diagnostic systems. More recently, we, we started uh, with the arrival of my respected colleague. We have started using uh, laser-based diagnostics, which is, uh, which is far more precise in places. And, uh, and we think that over the next few years, most of things that are uh, that have been electronically minded in diagnostics will become now optically or laser uh, minded.